right, so um, excited this week to continue in our book study of the uh, book, book of Jonah. Uh, and, and we kind of constituted last week what everybody thinks Jonah is all about. Uh, so one word that comes to your mind is probably well, isn't it? Yeah, so everybody thinks it's about a well. And, and really, that's uh, you know, one little portion of this story, but it's, the, the, it's about something so much bigger. So it's not about a big well, and so just as a play on words, we called it, it's a bit fishy. Because that's, it's about a guy who responds um, a, a, an unexpected way uh, to, to what God is calling him to do. And we're, and we're trying to we're placing ourselves in this guy's life as well, because we fit a whole lot uh, more than we think we would. Maybe we've never been swallowed by a well, hopefully, or a fish, a big fish. Uh, but we, we respond um, a lot of the ways that, that Jonah does, and we struggle with some of the same things. Um, so, so recap just a little bit. We, we talked last week, and we began with, um, we began with Jonah. Uh, we began in this, in this story, and basically Jonah is a prophet. A uh, prophet is a guy who speaks on behalf of God, and he uh, gets a message from God to go to his greatest, most hated enemy, the Ninevites, who were Assyrians. Uh, and we're going to see, you know, we see later on even in history why they were the most hated people. They're actually the ones who go in and destroy and, and take captive uh, Israel. So uh, he does not like these people, but, but he gets a message from God to go to these people and preach to them. He doesn't like that because he, he knows something. If I, if I go and preach to these people, God's going to give them an opportunity to, to repent, to turn around, come to him, and avoid judgment, and, and to change their lives. And Jonah doesn't want them to have that. He hates them. Why would you do something like that for people that you, that you don't like? God wanted them to turn around. So instead of them turning around, Jonah does. Turns around the opposite direction and runs away from what God's called him to do. Um, he hopped on a ship. So God wanted him to go to Nineveh, which is about 500 miles this way. So Jonah hops on a ship and goes 2,500 miles this way. I mean, talk about going the opposite direction, somewhere different from where you're supposed to be. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been lost before and looked up and you're totally somewhere you're not supposed to be. Uh, one time, I, I just, I don't know, I, I dazed or what, what happened. Uh, I was literally an hour from the place that I was going, through, going to. I already went through the city I was supposed to be. But the difference is Jonah did all this on purpose, goes the complete opposite direction. What happens is a storm hits, and then now it's just raging seas, uh, threatens the ship and everyone on board. While everyone else is frantic, thinking they're about to die, Jonah is asleep. Who can sleep through anything? Who's one of those people? Some of them aren't here today because they slept through that alarm that changed in the middle of the night. And they're watching online, and it's okay, I'm glad you're with us online. Um, so you can just sleep through anything. Uh, that was Jonah, he was, but, he, but he did that because he just didn't care. He, was, he wanted to run away so bad. So we, we, we see what happens at the very end of last week. We saw the captain, who's not a believer, he's a pagan, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in, in God. He believes in whatever, whatever God he wants to serve or pray to at the moment. Uh, runs down and wakes Jonah up, and he says, Jonah, start to pray. I mean, whenever you've got somebody that ain't even a Christian telling you to pray, I mean, you're doing something wrong. So, so he, he says, get up, pray to your God, we're going down. So we had two kind of big ideas. One of them is a theme that we're going to keep through Jonah that you're going to see coming up, coming up, coming up. And the kind of the idea of, of the whole of Jonah is that there's no distance that will remove you from the call of God, and there's no distance that will remove you from the care of God. So we'll see those played out in, 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 in great length all throughout this book. There's no distance that keeps you from what God's calling you to do, and there's no distance that keeps you from the care that he has for you. And then so, so kind of for the first week, in that first part of the chapter, we said the big idea is God is calling you to share his compassion. Are you following or are you fleeing? He's, following, he's calling you to share his compassion with others. What are we doing? And so today we're going to pick up at verse 7. If you want to go ahead and go to verse 7, we're going to get there in just a second. Uh, Jonah 1, 7. Um, we have, as a family, been through, well, I say, I guess all my family wasn't born at that time, but at least me and my wife, we've been through two hurricanes. So in, in a house, as the hurricane passes over, um, those are not the most fun situations that, um, that we have ever been in. I still enjoy it more than grocery shopping. Um, but 
it was it was very scary. So we're sitting in there, uh, you know, in the house. The first hurricane. It, it's while we're here in Lufkin. News. You know, a while back, you probably you probably went through that too. You're probably here. Uh, it was pretty powerful. I've never been through anything like that before. Try, and so smart me because you know, just out of curiosity, I'm trying to open the door during the hurricane. Like I just want to see what it was like. Yeah, it was pretty powerful. Okay. I uh, couldn't hardly open the door, and then I couldn't get it shut back. And the bad thing is I'm at somebody else's house. I'm about to break their door. I'm like, that was a bad idea, guys. I've said that a lot in my life. That, like, I'll admit, that was a bad idea. Not too smart. Like whenever I shaved with the wrong, with the wrong uh, length this morning, and now it looks like a baby face. That was a bad idea, guys. A bad idea. <clears throat> but so second hurricane, we are in Houston, and this time uh, the eye of the hurricane goes over our house. And so... Uh, of course, we go outside again. Why not? In the, in the eye of the hurricane, we walk outside and walk around. But it was just a crazy, intense, and scary thing to go through, uh, a hurricane. Who's ever been through just a major storm before? Now, I'm not talking like it's just raining a little bit or it's raining kind of hard. But I'm, you've been through something where, like, you know, the, the, the window panes are shaking, where you're considering the mattress uh, over the tub, and you're considering getting in that thing, maybe a tornado, hurricane, something where it's major, you've been flooded out of your house. If you've been through one of those, I mean, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about one of those East Texas, like it's raining one day and, and perfect the next. It's, it's a major storm. Well, so now translate that, the worst storm that you can think of, translate that to you're on a boat in the middle of the sea. And then, so now you're starting to picture kind of what, what Jonah and the crew are going through. Major storm, major winds hitting this ship. I didn't like being in a nice constructed house, much less would I like being on a boat in the middle of the sea during this incredible storm. Um, the, the sailors we, we even seen last week, they tried everything. They've thrown all the cargo overboard, a.k.a. they threw away all the goods that was going to make them any money. It's all gone. They, they, and you can read it in last week, they start praying to any god that will listen. And they pray to all the gods. I mean, it's like the god of the sea, the god of that piece of wood over there, the god of that bug that's coming, anything. I'm just going to pray, and maybe something will, will, will hear me. So that's what they're trying to get Jonah to do. Hey, pray to your god too. Maybe he's, he's going to hear, but obviously Jonah doesn't even do that. What these guys are, they're desperate for something to happen. They're desperate something's got to give. They're desperate for a change. Has ever been there? You're like, something's got to give. I'm just desperate for something to give. I mean, something's got to change. So Jonah 1, 7, the very first part of that says this. Um, here's what they do next. They've run out of options, so now they're just like, we're, hey, something's got to happen. We're, we're, we're kind of at, at plan Z right here. So the crew casts lots to see which one of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. Like somebody... It's been going on too long. Somebody's to blame here. Somebody's responsible. Uh, so we're going to cast lots. What does that mean? Cast lots is like uh, rolling the dice or, you know, playing uh, the short straw or, throw, you know, tossing a coin. That's kind of like what, what casting lots would be. Sometimes me and Christy, when the, when the kids are yelling at us and we're sitting there watching, um, watching TV, we look at each other and we do this number. I mean, yeah, so we're casting lots, right? We're like, who is going to, and then the best two out of three, best three out of five, best, yeah, so we go through all that, and maybe they'll be quiet while we do that, and no, so we see, we see, we cast lots to see who, who gets the lot, so that's essentially what's going on here, they're leaving it, they're leaving it to chance. So Jonah, here we find this guy running from God, realizes the storm is because of him, you got to know that, he's in the midst of this incredible storm the storm of his life, and he would rather try his luck than trust the Lord. He would rather try his luck, and maybe somebody else is going to get that. I mean, the chances of him getting picked are slim. It's everybody on the boat, all the crew. I mean, he's probably not going to get picked. It's probably not going to be him. We'll leave, it, we'll leave it to chance. Someone else can take the blame. Somebody else can figure out how to save us. I just want to escape this. Eventually, the storm is going to go away. The eyes will be off of me, at least, and the storm is going to pass. Um, I, think, I think a lot of our lives sometimes can really reflect the situation and, and the mindset and mentality that Jonah finds himself in. We can, we can stand and look around at other people. We can look at the storms. We can look at the situation. We can even look up to God, seeing 
all of that for the reasons why we're going through what we're going through. We can blame, we can try to justify the reason that I'm right and trying to avoid my own responsibility in the situation that I'm finding myself in. I mean, why couldn't they be to blame, right? I mean, these, these guys aren't, aren't, aren't Christians. They're not God-fearing people. They're, they're pagans. Why, I mean, why couldn't it just be a bad storm, you know? Um, why couldn't these people be to blame? You know, and then we translate it to us, but, but they, they hurt me. They, they haven't changed, so why should I? Well, God's just against me. I think we've probably said these things before. We look at all these external things instead of introspectively looking and seeing, hey, what, what can I do and where am I wrong? And we're, we're leaving our life to chance. I'd rather chance life than own it because if I own it, I've got to do something about it. So we're like, we're like Jonah. He's, he's chanting it. Like, uh, somebody else can take the blame for this. I'm, I'm not going to take the blame. So Jonah 1, the last part, uh, 7, the last part of that, it says, when they did this, they cast lots. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. So, like, God's like, nah, you ain't going to get away that easy. Like, I'll use a game of dice. I will, I will use uh, the, you, you drawing the short straw if we've got to. But, it, you know, but you need to know your responsibility in this. It lands on Jonah. Now there's no escaping. All eyes are on him. And they're like, what have you done? Okay, it must be you. There's no more avoiding the, the fact of what's going on. Verse 8. And so they, they start to... Just bring all these questions to him at one time, flood him with questions. And it says, why is this awful storm come down on us? Who are you? What's your line of work? What country are you from? What's your nationality? They're trying to get to the root of the problem. And imagine at this point they're yelling because the storm is going on. What have you done? Who are you? And so they're, they're asking all these questions, trying to figure out why this is happening to them. These questions make Jonah do exactly what he didn't want to do, that the, the thing that he's been avoiding doing, he's got to look inside and ask himself, who am I really? He's got to confront some of his own things that he's been trying to avoid, when now I, all eyes are on him. There's no avoiding it. Jonah 1, 9 says this, Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. See, Jonah, what we see about him, I'm sure he didn't hesitate. Like, immediately when they asked him the question, he, he, he said the answer because Jonah knew the right answer. Jonah knew what to say. He'd probably answered this a thousand times and said, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord. It's probably just something that he said. So I, I want this to play a, little, play a little game here. Okay, what do you say when I say or when I do something? So whenever I sneeze, what do you say? God bless you. Because I'm tight or whatever, whatever that means. Like, God bless you. Okay, so I say, now, how are you? What do you say? Good, fine. I'm good. Yeah, it's great. Um, thank you, you say. Unless you work at Chick-fil-A, then you say? My pleasure. There we go, yeah. Who's ever worked at Chick-fil-A? Yeah, so <laughs> who says it ingrained in your brain? Um, yeah, so my pleasure, or, or whatever it is. You don't necessarily, here, here's, here's the fact of the matter. You don't necessarily mean these things. It's just your response. You know what to say. You know what to say. This is a, this is a line that Jonah knew what to say. But the problem is, he didn't believe what he said. Somewhere along the way, his belief when in God had become more of an automated response than, than, than a heartfelt, meaningful response. It was a reaction, not, not a heartfelt response. His actions that he was doing didn't, didn't match what he was responding with. Because he said, I worshipped God, but he wouldn't obey him. He wouldn't following him. He was running 2,500 miles away but the but the big thing here is all this line of questions we've got to know about ourselves. we've got we've got to look at ourselves and ask these questions that they did and these questions being hey who am i well, what is it that i'm doing and and what do i belong to what, what do i trust where, where do i place my life in 
and, and how many of our responses that we have in life are just automated, not really heartfelt. How many times have we said to our spouse, I love you, out of an automated response, but not because we, we, we feel something passionately anymore? How many times have we said, I'm sorry, just to get out of something because we know it's the automated response? How many times have we said, I believe in God, but it's an automated response? It's just something we say. We know what to say. We know what the right answer is. But something's got to change to where I'm not just saying I'm a Christian or I trust God or I believe God. It's the appropriate and it's the expected response that everyone says that you should come back with. But when we really confront ourselves, we have to ask, do I? I mean, do I believe these things that I'm saying? Because if Jonah was being real honest, he didn't believe a word of the things that he was saying. The things that he said a thousand times, they've lost their meaning. He knew who he was supposed to be, who he was supposed to worship, where he was supposed to trust. But somewhere along the way, it became something that he said, not something that he did. We have to confront these questions on our own. Hey, who, who am I? What, what's the root of who I am? Who do I belong to? Where, where, where's my life rooted? We've got to know these things. See, because I think here, here's a big um, problem and theme of what's going on right here. That Jonah doesn't understand that we have to. Jonah thinks it's all about going to Nineveh, but that's not really all it's about. See, God is more concerned with who we are in him than what we do for him. Okay, God, God's more concerned with who you are in him than what you do for him. It's just Jonah's lack of going to Nineveh just revealed his heart condition and how it already was. So God, what he was doing at this point was he was not trying to destroy Jonah. He was not trying to disown Jonah. He was going through extreme extensive measures, not just to get Jonah to Nineveh, but so that he could get Jonah back to him. Because Jonah had left, and we see the reason he had went the other way, not because he wanted to get rid of, to get away from Nineveh. In the first chap, in the first message that we preached, in the very first few verses, it said he wanted to, uh, get himself away from the presence of God. And so God is far more concerned with just getting Jonah back. Jonah, I just, I just want you to know me again. Not to have some automated response about who you are, but know the God of your response. Know who I am because I'm so passionate about you. He wanted Jonah to be reminded of who he was and who God was. Because somewhere along the way, he, he'd lost his way. God wants to remind us of the same thing. God wants to remind you of who you are, that you're his. And God wants to remind you who he is, that he's for you. God is love. God wants to remind us of that. He wants us to trust him, to run toward him. Like Jonah, I think we have to ask ourselves these questions, and then we have to see, does what I say match what I do? I believe in God. I believe that he is the God, the creator, and the sustainer of everything, but, but I really don't live like I believe it. Or I know that's what I'm supposed to say. I've grown up in the Bible belt. I know that there's church on every corner. I realize what the automated response is supposed to be, that you're supposed to love God. But I, I, there's not a fiber in my being that believes it. And God is just saying, hey, first off, I just want, to, I want you to know me. So that when you say that statement, you know it's true. We'd rather trust in the luck of life than trust with the Lord with our life. I'll try things my own way. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I can figure this out. I'll get out of the storm. But, but God's like, no, no, no. Your step one is, is trust me. Trust me. Jonah 1.10. said the sailors, when, when Jonah said all that, who he was, who God was, the sailors were terrified when they heard this. For he had already told them previously, he, they already, he already told them this, that he was running from the Lord. And then they said, oh, why did you do it, they groaned? Because now he revealed something else. Wait, so you're, what you're, what, so hold up, right? I, I imagine they're like, wait, so what you're telling me is, if you ever hear that response, I mean, somebody's psychoanalyzing you, so, so you better watch your response. So what you're telling me is... You hear that whenever you're talking to your wife, you better, you better hold up. 
No, 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 no. I said what I meant. I didn't mean anything else. All right. But, but, but they're like, what you're telling me is you're running from God. Okay, you told us that earlier. That's cool. I didn't know who your God was. But now you tell me that you're running from God who controls the sea while you're on the sea? And you brought us with you? What were you thinking, man? And so now they're terrified. Why? Because they believe in his God now more than he does. He said it, but they actually believe that this God is in charge of the sea that they're on because they see what's going on. No pun intended. See, so many times, here, here's the problem. He's on the sea in a storm running from the one who controls the sea. And so many times in life, we're the same way. We're running from the very one who can control the situation and the storm that we're in. We're trying to do it our own way, and God's the one who controls the storm. God's the one that controls the situation, but we're trying to run from the one who can do something about it. So Jonah's doing He's running away and trying to do it on his own, and if he would just trust the, the one who could do something about it, it would be over. It's easy to serve the God of plenty and paradise. Come on, that's easy. When things were going Jonah's way, life was good. He could be a prophet and do what God wanted to do because he was, God was doing what he wanted to do. But it's difficult to trust the God of the struggle and the storm. But we have to realize the same God that is the God of the land and the God of the stable is the same God that is the God of the sea and God of the struggle. And we can't run from the one who can control it and take care of it. When things get difficult, when things don't go our way, we have to trust. See, but just like Jonah, God is still pursuing us. We don't get off the hook that easy just because we turn around and run away from God because we don't want to serve God doesn't mean that God is done with us. Why? Because God just loves you too much. God's too crazy about you just to give up. He's still pursuing us. He's not satisfied with us running the other direction and, and going over here. He's not satisfied with that because he knows what he has over here. So even if a storm has to be in the way to stop us, he wants to get us over here because he knows what's in front of us over here. He's still pursuing us. Jonah 1, 11 and 12 says this. And since the storm was getting worse, all the time, they asked him. So the storm is continually getting worse and worse. It's not getting better. It's not going to let itself up. They asked him, what should we do to you to stop this? And Jonah said, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. That's the first reading. We're like, that sounds very noble, right? Sounds really good. Like he's finally coming to his senses. Throw me into the sea. He's starting to take some responsibility but he, he, here's what's going on. He's still not taking action. He sees some responsibility that he, he has in life that he needs to do something about, but he's still not doing something about it. He saw inside and knows that there's something that needs to change. Now there's, a, there's a spot inside of him that's got to go a different direction, but he's not willing to do it himself. He's still not willing to go back the other direction and do what God has called him to do. Because realize this. He could have just told the captain to turn the ship in the opposite direction. He could have just jumped off the boat. But no, what he said is, you can throw me over the ship. That way it's your fault. He could have just plunged off the edge of self. He was so noble, but he still didn't want to take the action to do what was required to turn around. Jonah wanted the storm to stop, but he still wasn't willing to go back to where you're supposed to be. Still wasn't willing to turn around. Still wasn't, wasn't willing to confront some of those things that he just needed to give up and get rid of. See, here, here's, here's where we find ourselves in this too. Jonah was concerned with the condition that he was in, right? I'm sure he didn't love the storm. I'm sure it wasn't like a, a water park ride. There's no guarantees out on the sea. He wanted the condition to change. And that's the way we do too in life. 
We want our condition to change. We want the, the struggle that we're in to be different. We want the struggle of the marriage to be over. We want the difficult time to stop. But the difference of how we look at things is we want our condition to change. God, if you can just change this thing that's, that's happening right now. But God doesn't just want to change your condition. He wants to change your direction. You understand that? God is less concerned with just the immediate temporary condition that you're in and he wants you to turn around and change the direction that your life is going because he knows something a life that's fallen in the right right direction can withstand any condition and you can hold up to anything because you're hand in hand with God himself because you're following after him then nothing is too strong because you're not by yourself but there's no condition that's right if the direction is wrong we want to change the, the circumstance, the superficial things, the, the, maybe the temporary pain that we're going through or the, or the thing. And God says, no, I want to change you. And then we're going to worry about that stuff. See, just like Jesus re repeated in the New Testament, seek first the kingdom of God. If you'll change your direction, then all these things will be added unto you. The condition will follow. But we're worried about the condition but we don't want to change our direction and where we're going, where we're, the choices that we're making, what we're facing. We, we don't want to turn around and do what we're supposed to do. Jonah wasn't willing to look up and say, hey, I've got some things I've got to deal with. People run away from life all the time trying to improve their condition. They run away from things all the time trying to make things different, better. They quit working on their marriage. They, they, they quit when the job gets difficult. All because they think that's going to change the condition. But God wants the direction that we face to be more important than the conditions that we're in. Our direction is more important than our, our condition. Because we have to understand, God is pursuing you. God is pursuing you. He's not giving up. Because you're worth fighting for. You're worth it. Jonah 1, 13 through 16 says this. He said, throw me overboard. And the sailors said, instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. They were still trying to go this direction with all their might, with everything they have. Then they, they did what Jonah wouldn't. Here's the key. Even these guys who did not even know God did what Jonah wouldn't do. It says they cried out to the Lord. Jonah's God. It's not just any God now. They realize who controls. They realize who's in charge. They realize who is all powerful. And they realize who deserves their life. They cried out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, they pleaded. Don't make us die for this man's sin. Don't hold us responsible for his death, oh, Lord. You have sent the storm upon him for your own good reasons. Like, I don't know why you did it. I don't know the whole situation, but it's happening. And we're in the middle. Don't let us die for his sin. Then the sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea. And the storm stopped at once. Imagine. Psh, psh. Like, I mean, I would be tempted for a second to, like, let's pull him back in. You like you throw down a rope and the whoosh, okay, you pull the rope up and it stops. Throw a rope down, the lightning. I was like, okay, dude, you're on your own down there. They're like we're we're, we're kind of done with this. They're like, it's, so so what what do they do? It stops and the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power. They offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. I mean, God got glory even if Jonah wouldn't do his job. God still got glory. The sailors trusted in Jonah's God more than he did. He still refused to turn around. So he was thrown <laughs> off the ship. See, like Jonah, we have, to, um, we have to take ownership. We have to look inside. We have to look at, man, what do I need to do? Take ownership for some things and say, man, where am I? What, what, what can I change and what can I do? Who am I? We've got to ask, ask ourselves these questions, these introspective, you know, let's look deep and think about why I am where I am kind of questions. Who am I? What, what has me? What is it that I'm trusting and that I'm basing my life on? And then what I've got to do is I've got to take the steps to act in the right direction. Make sure it's not just something we say. 
Make sure it's something that we act on. And we can't act on something that we don't believe. Man, God believes in us. He's just saying, hey, remember who I am, that I'm a good God and I'm for you. Maybe you see some ownership today. If you were to step back and think about, maybe there's some ownership in your marriage that you need to take and begin to take some action in the right direction. Maybe there's some ownership in your finances that today you need to take some ownership for and take some action in the right direction. Maybe there's some ownership in your job that you need to take some responsibility, take some action in the right direction. Look at the storm you're in and say, hey, is there, is there something that I need to do? But bigger than all this, in your faith, too many of us are headed this complete wrong direction. We're headed away from God. When things don't go our way, we flee, we go. But God's pursuing you. And what I love about this story is we're going to see again next week. We see continually in Jonah that God is pursuing us and he doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. Over and over and over and over again because he loves us too much because he knows the stakes are too high to leave to chance and the luck of life, he keeps pursuing us and pursuing us and pursuing us. He's like, hey, I want to change your condition, but first, change your direction and follow after me. Because I am God of the land and the sea, everything in it, any storm or any plenty that you go through. And you just look at me and you'll follow after me. I've got this. Turn toward him and not away. Some of us are still in that phase where it's like, man, I know there's some things i got to do. I'm going to do it one day. Man, if somebody else can just pick me up and throw me, that'll be good. Look, <laughs> I ain't going to throw you today. I'm not going to throw you off the balcony and hope, and hope the storm dies down for everybody else. What I am going to do is challenge you to see, hey, is, is there some responsibility, something that I can do and change my direction? take action that way. God's not just so concerned with what you do for him and marking off a checklist and coming to church. What, what can your life accomplish? God wants you. And God wants your heart. If we've wandered off or we've let this become just a, a thing that we say and not do, God wants your heart back. Remind yourself constantly. Not to make it an automated response, but to get it deep in. See, he said, I'm, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord. We have to know, man, I'm, I'm a believer in Christ. I worship the God of the universe, the Lord of the land and the sea and everything in it that happens, he's in control. That's the God that I worship. And it has to be a reminder every day to say, man, that's the God that I serve. And the fact that I say that isn't something automated that I say. It's because I believe it and it's deep-rooted. It's who I am. So every, every step that I take, every response that I have is based on the fact that that's true. Act on the faith that you say that you have. God's good. And even when we're not, God's not done. It's not that easy. He loves us too much. Would you stand up with me? Father, we... we God, we just praise you this morning, and God, I know just like Jonah was fleeing away from you and going his own direction, God, I know we can do the same things, and help us to see where we need to change, to turn and give our lives completely to you. In this place this morning, as your heads are bowed, maybe... Hey, man, you just, you just, you don't know God. You don't have that relationship with him. I mean, God is right there. As simple as a prayer away, he said, I want to flood your life. I want to make you new. And if today you say, hey, I, I need to give my life to God. I've been doing things my own way. I want to give my life to God today. If that's you, if you'd slip your hand up, I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray over everybody this morning.
God, help us to understand and to realize who we are and who you are. There's some people in here this morning, God, that feels like it's just time to give up. And why even try anymore? But God, you're not done. God, we turn and we face you. And more than ever before, we take action to chase after you, our God. Because we know that you're the God of everything. We place our life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's sermon at City Church. We are passionate about seeing people lead full lives in Christ. And we truly hope that you've been impacted today by God's word. If there's anything that we can do for you, or you would like to share with us what God has spoken to you today through this message, please email us at info at citychurchlufkin.com. Or for more information about who we are, visit us online at citychurchlufkin.com. Dot com.